can we talk about Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition and more specifically its representation in video games. I think the first thing we need to do is understand where 5th edition or 5e as I'll probably slip into calling it has brought Dungeons and Dragons. Wizards of the Coast released 5th edition's basic rules on the 3rd of July 2014 and a starter set including a set of instructions, a set of pre-generated characters and the first adventure module Lost Mine of Van Delver which is fucking terrible by the way, on the 15th of July 2014. It released at a tricky time in Dungeons Dragons history as it followed on the foot of the much maligned 4th edition, while still having its defenders is largely thought of as a misstep for Wizards of the Coast. Up until this point, Dungeons and Dragons had sort of built its mechanics on top of each other. Uh, first edition, you go back to that time period, they were making it up as they went. They were literally building the road as they were driving down it. They were war gamers, right? Miniatures or hex and encounters. And, and and suddenly they're playing role-playing games, right? It's a huge transition. And then in second edition, you see, okay, now it's about world building. Let's, let's start doing that. And it was like, it's very much a product of its time. Like at that time, no one had really done world building before. So what's a sensible thing to do? Well, let's just start describing these worlds in detail. Like we need to know, answer all these questions. They didn't yet know what questions they needed to ask. So they just had to start asking all the questions. You know, everything we do is built on the foundations that have come before. As D&D aged, the systems grew and grew, and with each edition layered another mechanic onto another, which culminated in edition 3.5, which had so many different mechanics and rules, despite being very fondly regarded, had players calling out for more clarification and more structure to the unwieldy beast that Dungeons and Dragons had become. Fourth edition was Wizards of the Coast's response to this, as they attempted to firm up the structure and solidify the rules of the game. What ended up happening, however, was D&D taking on a real video game feel to it. Gone was the emphasis on story building, role playing and world building, and in came models, grid based combat, and a real focus on balance. Comparisons at the time were made to the MMO genre which around that time of 4E's release date in 2008 were booming due to the popularity of Blizzard's World of Warcraft, and that was a comparison which was not meant favourably to D&D. While still performing well sales-wise compared to other tabletop RPGs, I mean it is Dungeons & Dragons after all, 5th edition made it clear that the path Wizards took with 4th edition was considered a mistake. In the same way 4th edition was a commentary on the editions before it, 5e looked at where D&D was going, namely a more wargaming driven approach, and decided to go another way. If you were to sum up what 5th edition did to D&D in two words, I would use streamlined and simplified. The edition looked absolutely nothing like its predecessor. The emphasis on grid and model based combat was, while not gone, certainly de-emphasized, and theatre of the mind was back in the spotlight. Um, part of making the rules simpler was this idea of embracing the fear of the mind approach to combat, where the DM is really just explaining things and rather than using a grid. Um, the grid inherently makes combat a little more complex, like it's clearer because you can see where everything is, mm -hmm. but then the rules for like, well, how do I move? It starts feeling more like a board game and players kind of expect the rules to be a little, little denser than they otherwise could be. So that was, that was one part of it. We wanted to keep the combat as simple as possible. Fourth edition looked at how complex D&D had become over the years and tried to put a structure around all that complexity. Fifth edition decided to take a hammer to that structure and complexity and just throw it all out the window. Saving throws were simplified, feats were simplified, skills were simplified, working out whether a spell could affect an enemy was easier, resistances were simplified, the list goes on and on and on. If you're in any way familiar with D&D, you don't need me to tell you that in terms of sales and popularity, 5th edition was a roaring success. Some players mourned the dramatic change from 4th edition, and even more players complained about the amount of simplification, especially compared to the beloved 3.5, but all those voices were completely drowned out by the newfound audience the game had gotten. When you listen to Wizards of the Coast talk about the design for 5th edition, you rarely hear them talk about simplification as it's become sort of a trap word for them now. However, you do hear them talk a lot about going back to the roots of D&D. Although they don't say it plainly, I get the impression that they felt that was lost when they created 4th edition and tried to build a structure around what D&D had become. We did in the design of fifth try to slice down as many of the layers between what we saw as your character identity and the things you did. As an example, saving throws now in fifth are just ability score checks. 
And whenever possible, we wanted to get rid of all the terms and, 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 and uh, things that were between what we thought of as like, this is what defines your character. We kind of saw that as the ability scores and then everything else in the game. You know, make it really driven by saying, okay, I rolled an 18 strength. So my character is super strong. And so make that, okay, I right. keep making strength checks and I'm using my strength to attack and I'm using strength for my, my, my you know, an athletics check and things like that. Balance was a key design feature in 4th edition, but when you listen to Mike Merles, one of the co-creators of 5th edition, talk about balance, you get the sense that they had really loosened the rules when it came to balancing really everything in order to bring back the feel of Dungeons & Dragons. So why am I telling you all this? Well, I think it relates to video games and the history of how D&D 5th edition was created uh, bodes pretty well, I think, uh, in the future for video games. We haven't really seen it yet, so despite its popularity, we've only really had two major games that use the D&D 5th edition rule set. So we have Solasta, Crown of the Magister, which is currently out, um, and then we have Baldur's Gate 3, which is currently being developed by Larian Studios, and is due to be released next year in 2023. There was a game called Sword Coast Legends back in 2015, but I think the less said about that, the better. The point here is, we haven't really seen 5th edition properly in the video game space, especially in comparison to earlier D&D editions. You know, some of the really classic CRPGs in video games were derived from the Dungeons & Dragons rule set. So you had, you know, Baldur's Gates, you had your Neverwinter Nights, your Icewind Dales, your Planescape Torments, etc, etc. But that hasn't really carried on into 5th edition yet. There are two main reasons I think 5th edition in video games is going to work for a lot of people. Simplification and impactful choices. These two definitely feed into each other to create the experience I think a lot of people are going to connect with, but they do stand separately from one another, and I'm going to break them down here just a bit, starting with simplification. To give you some context, I'm going to show you three pictures now. These three pictures are all from popular CRPGs. Elcat's Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous, Obsidian's Pillars of Eternity Deadfire, and Tactical Adventures, Salasta, Crown of the Magister. And they're going to show you on the screen the calculation that goes into a single melee hit. That is to say, the calculation that involves what it takes to actually hit the monster you're swinging at, and then the subsequent calculation that works out how much damage you do. So, firstly, without commentary, here is Wrath of the Righteous, which is using the first edition Pathfinder rule set. Here is Pillars of Eternity Deadfire, which is using a homebrew rule set created for the game by, I think, Josh Sawyer, although he probably worked within a team. And finally, here is Salasta's Crown of the Magister, which is using the 5th edition rule set. So I'm not, I'm not going to break down these pictures and explain the calculations behind them, because I definitely, definitely know that off the top of my head. But I think it's pretty evident which ones are more complex than others. So, so what does this actually mean? Why am I showing you pictures of hit calculations, you person that has somehow stayed listening to me in this video, putting up pictures of to hit calculations? Well, tell me if this is you. You like playing RPGs. You've even played a few CRPGs, perhaps Dragon Age Origins or Divinity Original Sin. You think they're cool. You think spells are pretty neat, but you play at a surface level. You pick up a sword that says it does 1.5 armor penetration and 0.75 stamina regen and 14 damage, and you equip it over your old sword that does 0.5 armor penetration but 3% critical chance because the game gives you an indicator that it's better by flashing up some green text over the damage text. When you click to hit something, sometimes you'll miss, but more than often you'll hit, and that's good enough for you. You have 100 hours put into the game, but if someone asked you to work out how much damage you do on a single hit, you'd actually have to hit something and read out what the floating text says in order to tell that person. No judgement here. That's me for a lot of games. I recently finished Dragon Age Inquisition on the hardest difficulty, and even after that, I couldn't tell you exactly how everything was calculated. I think there's a sort of inertia in how we deal with the numbers behind the screen in a lot of RPGs. And a lot of the time, that's because developers had made it, have made it so difficult to actually understand the rules and the calculations of the game that we just go on autopilot and allow the game to guide us. And developers have, I think, responded to that way of playing too. Item text will be color coded to allow the player to tell which one is more powerful. A lot of the time weapons will just have a damage number which will flash up either red or green to indicate which one the player should be choosing over the other. And listen, 
Okay, like I said, that's no judgment here. That is fine for a lot of people. If you're sitting here thinking, yeah, so what? That's a, that's a fucking grand way to play the game. Just fuck off, YouTuber. Listen, that's grand. Many of us are happy to ignore that side of RPGs and like focus on other things that the game has to offer, like the story or, you know, the actual combat itself, not the numbers behind it, etc., etc. But in my opinion, CRPGs especially reward the player for understanding their systems. Once you do, you make more informed decisions, you plan better for combat. If something goes wrong and you die, you can understand what went wrong and then adapt your play to overcome the challenge presented. It just makes everything more rewarding. So to get back to our original point, 5th edition in Dungeons & Dragons is great for this. Because if we look at our little calculation picture again, this is easy to understand, or certainly relatively easy to understand. One of the huge successes Wizards of the Coast had with 5th edition was its ability to expand its audience. Now, when you listen to interviews or people talk about the rule set, a lot of that is put down to the emphasis on stuff like role play and storytelling, world building, all that kind of good stuff. And I think that's a fair read. But the essence of Dungeons and Dragons is combat. And a rule set that's easy to understand is a rule set that is more enjoyable to interact with. Once you have a system that's easy to understand and you're happy to interact with and learn, you start making more informed decisions. Which leads to our second point for today, impactful choices. Character customization and how you want to play your character in an RPG has become a massive pillar of what these games mean. In the tabletop version, a lot of it is role-playing uh, kind of stuff. So like, you know, what is your background? What kind of character do you want to be? What are their goals, their aspirations, their weaknesses? In video games, it kind of takes that back and looks more towards the mechanics, especially how it, it, how it means in regards to combat. So, you know, do you want to be a very strong fighter? Do you want to play as a tank who soaks all the damage in the front line? Or do you want to hold, you know, a weapon in two hands and do a ton of damage? Do you want to be a mage slinging high damage fireballs or instead do you want to specialize into say crowd control or something like that the point is that these games are trying to give you a lot of options so you can pick the character that you want to play and that sounds great but as these games have progressed we've been given more and more options and i think it has an effect of sort of paralyzing a player in a certain aspect you know if we go back to look at wrath of the righteous for example that game has 25 classes and over 150 subclasses that you pick from the very start of the game and when you factor in that that game has a really cool multi-classing system the amount of choices is just extraordinary you look at another game, say, for example, Path of Exile, which is a really popular action RPG, and I'm sure everybody knows about the infamous skill wheel that that game has. Now, don't get me wrong. This amount of choice is amazing when you get into it, but that's the crux of it. The more decisions you can make, the more complexity of choice is heaped on top of you, and it becomes a sort of barrier to entry. When you hurdle that barrier and get into the sweet, sweet field of choices it's great but a lot of that time players either fall or don't even bother to make that barrier in the first place when you google for help in understanding path of exile's skill wheel the most common piece of advice is just to copy a build from the internet and then try to learn the game as you use that build similarly in mmos I used to raid in WoW a few years ago, and despite the amount of choice on offer in that game, unless you're at the very top, if you wanted to do well, you use guides from the pros on how to build your character. CCG players will have this experience too. I haven't played Hearthstone in a long time, but I'm willing to bet despite the 1,304 cards currently in use, there are very strict decks that the majority of the players will Google and build. These will be called the meta decks. This is what the overabundance of choice can do to a lot of players who are not deeply invested in a game. The amount of choice you're given almost subverts what you would expect and actually restricts players into playing the way they Googled off the internet. This isn't so bad for games that are made to be played over a long period of time. Multiplayer games like Hearthstone or World of Warcraft or games with a grind like Path of Exile gets away with this to an extent because there's a pipeline there to understanding the systems through repeated play. 
The reason the main tip for Path of Exile is to pick a popular build and use that at first is because that build can carry you at the beginning and allow you time to understand and learn the systems. A lot of CCG players will tell you that yes, there are a lot of decks online that people use, but when you get good at the game and develop a firm understanding of the meta and the cards, you can swap in some cards to make that deck your own, or if you get very good, create your own full decks. This though falls apart somewhat when we look at the single player RPG, a game genre that while can definitely be replayed, for the vast majority of players it will be a one and done experience. They just don't have the time nor the inclination to learn the calculation behind this. So Wizards of the Coast went a step further when they decided to strip back D&D in the creation of 5th edition. Their goal wasn't just to simplify their mechanics, it was also to give the players impactful choices that they could understand. When you see something cool, you should just be able to know it's cool and strong without having to understand how a complex web of say feats interact with it, or how it compares to enemies' inbuilt resistances. We very intentionally made, for instance, like Fireball as a third level spell, is damage-wise, math-wise, it's too powerful. Because, but but we did that by design because people, right. oh D and D a fireball right getting fireballs awesome so it's like yes it is right we're going to make that true. One of the best examples of this in fifth edition can be found when we look at the itemization of the game. As we said before, five E does away with a lot of stats and attributes that you would usually find in an RPG because stats in fifth edition are so basic. Generally, it's just the weapon's damage, it's the hit bonus, and some additional modifiers. Because it's just those, they also come with an ability, and it's that ability which makes the weapon stand out. This stands in stark contrast to pretty much every CRPG out there which focuses heavily on how that item can alter the calculation that triggers, say, whenever you try to kill something. So let's go back to looking at pictures to illustrate my point better. This is a weapon from Dragon Age Inquisition. If you're in any way familiar with video game RPGs, you've seen a weapon like this before. Let's have a look at it. It does 77 to 80 DPS and 69 to 72 damage. Yes, those are two different stats in the game. It has plus 3% attack, plus 3% critical damage bonus, and plus 2% sunder on hit. Now, if you've played Dragon Age Inquisition and you don't know how this actually manifests in the game, don't feel bad. You're not alone. The mechanics behind Dragon Age Inquisition would take your one from a rival to make sense of. You get a vague idea, but that's all it is. Unless you know this game inside out, it's just a vague idea. Now, you might look at this and go, hey, no, Zale, this is all pretty straightforward. I know what attack means, and I know what critical damage bonus means. I assume Sunder is like some sort of debuff to armor. Okay, fair enough, but I challenge you, is that item I have on the screen here better than this one? What about this one? Let's have a look at an item in Baldur's Gate 3, the upcoming 5th edition game. Straight away, I think you can see the difference here. There are no complicated stats. If you wield the weapon one-handed, you do 1d8 points of bludgeoning damage, and if you use it both hands, you do 1d10. Then, underneath, you can see the ability, which, although not as cool as many items you can find in the tabletop version, is still pretty cool, but more importantly, it's immediately understandable. As long as you understand what 1d8 points of bludgeoning damage, and that's not a big ask if you don't know Dungeons and Dragons, when you play Baldur's Gate 3 you'll learn this very quickly. Once you know what that means, you understand what this weapon does, because the ability is so clear. With that understanding, you can pick what weapon you want in order to impact the combat in the way you want, rather than have to rely on the in-game system to just tell you which one is the upgrade. And I didn't cherry pick examples here. Go Google items in Dragon Age Inquisition and then items in Baldur's Gate 3 and you can see for yourself. Another way 5th edition encourages important decision making is through the use of the concentration mechanic. In 5e, a lot of spells, usually the more powerful ones within their level, comes with the tag concentration. This simply means that you can only have one concentration spell active at a time. If you cast, say, the blind spell on someone and it succeeds, you must now hold concentration on that spell to keep it active. If you try to cast another spell with concentration, you have to drop the previous one. Again, very clear decision making here, right? You can't just fling out spells willy nilly now. You have to make the choice on what powerful spell you want active. And again, 
like everything in 5th edition, it's a very understandable choice. While making the right decision in the moment might take some skill and knowledge of the game, you have all the tools you need to immediately understand that decision. This also tackles buff stacking, which is a little pet peeve of mine in CRPGs. Buff stacking is when you prepare for a fight you know is incoming by casting every single buff spell you have on your entire party. I think this is a huge issue in CRPGs and even like massive fans of CRPGs like myself uh, and you see it on like you know if you go onto the Wrath of the Righteous forums they'll acknowledge it too. It's an issue. I grabbed a screenshot towards the end of one of my playthroughs of Wrath of the Righteous to show you how ridiculous it can get. I mean look at that. I needed a mod in order to properly manage that. But in 5th edition, many of the buffs come with the concentration tag. So again, you need to decide in the battle if you should use your concentration on an offensive spell or a defensive spell. If you're going to use it to buff someone, what buff are you going to pick? Because you can only pick one. Now, concentration isn't perfect. It has its issues and I think it's a bit too restrictive. But it's another example of clear decision making that you, as a new player to Baldur's Gate 3 or Salasta or 5e in general, you will be able to make that without any prior knowledge of the game. It's taken a surprisingly long time, but 5th edition is coming to video games. And with Wizards of the Coast's decision on prolonging the rule set with the move to 1 D&D, it's not going anywhere. We've already seen glimpses of it in Salasta, but that was a game with relatively small reach. Baldur's Gate 3 is coming in 2023, hopefully, and that will be the game that will really put eyes on the experience of playing with a 5th edition rule set in a video game space. And I think it has the potential to carry over its tabletop success.